Hey Joshua, how's it going? Yep, it's the uh, time for a uh, second round of midterms. I guess we're uh, we're no exception. We have our, our second midterm next week, so yeah, it's another busy time for for you guys. Yeah, we'll talk a bit about it today.
Professor. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, quick question for you. When is the test uh, this week coming up or is it next week? It's next week. So it's next Wednesday. All right. Yep. So mm -hmm. the 21st then? Yep, 21st. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, another question for you, Professor. Um, mm -hmm. I guess this is a general question. Is that do you know any um, like summer or pretty much like a, if if I can't do an internship, is there a way for me to uh, I feel like you can get involved with like a summer project or uh, something? Like yeah, maybe, maybe let's let's talk offline about that. Um, maybe you can send me an email and then we can uh, we can discuss that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's uh, two thirty, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? How's your weekend? All right. Good. 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 Yep. Yeah, I, I know things are getting busy. Yeah, I'm good too. I, I had a nice weekend. So I, uh, I uh, on Saturday, I went down to Crystal Cove with uh, uh, Crystal Cove State Park with my fiance. So the weather was nice, so we thought it'd be a nice day to go to the beach. Uh, and Crystal Cove is, is someplace we've always uh, we've always liked just because it's it's a state park, so it's not as crowded as some of the other beaches, and you know they have all the tide pools and stuff like that. So um, that was that was really really nice for us. Uh, okay, and so uh, this week we're going to continue on uh, with our lecture notes on heat exchangers, right? uh, and so we should finish up um, by Wednesday, uh, and so we'll get we'll get through a lot of it today, and then I think Wednesday we'll finish up just the last um, bit of it. Okay. Um, and then uh, next week is our midterm. And so uh, a couple of people asked about that um, beginning of class today or before the class. But let's uh, let's kind of just write down everything just so that we all kind of know what's going on. Right? All right. All right. So the midterm is going to be next Wednesday. Okay. Uh, 421. <laughs> I, had I had something else on my mind. <laughs> um, and it's uh, it's right after 4:20, so uh, and so I I didn't realize that until until uh, just now actually. So uh, so I apologize. So you know um, you know if you guys are, are into that stuff, then you know maybe you won't be able to enjoy 4:20 as much with the uh, with the midterm looming on the next day. So uh, so I apologize, but maybe after the midterm you can you can go ahead and enjoy um, you know the uh, things that you would do on 4:20. Okay. Um, Format is going to be exactly the same as the first midterm, and so it's going to be uh, it's going to take place in class. It's going to be ninety minutes, okay. right? So that's going to be two thirty to four p.m. Okay, um, and then the number of questions is going to be exactly the same too, and so it's going to be three short answer questions, three conceptual questions. What and range would the uh, test cover? Like homeworks uh, three, four, five, or uh, it would be four, five, and then also six. Uh, so there's going to be one more homework I'm going to post today, just to give you guys some practice with free convection and heat exchangers, um, and so it's going to cover cover that. So it's basically everything. It's basically our convection unit, and so starting with um, I think the first thing we did was like intro to convection, then external convection, internal convection, free convection, and then now heat exchangers. And so it's it's five five weeks worth of of content. Okay, um, and so to help you guys prepare for the exam, so just like I did for the first one, I've, I posted a study guide on Canvas, um, and so you can find the study guide, um, you know, from the week twelve page, and so um, you know you can take a look at that, and definitely use that to help you guys study, right? Um, and then also this Friday, I'm going to be recording a review video, just like I did for the first midterm as well. Okay, and so I want to wait till after we finish um, heat exchangers um, to post the, uh, um, you know, to post the poll. And so just like last time, you know, I'll post a poll on Canvas just so people can vote on, you know, the topics they feel most uncomfortable with. And then based on the poll results, I'm going to review um, probably the top two topics um, on, um, you know, on during the review session. Okay. Uh, one other thing I provided for you guys is uh, what I like to call like a convection summary handout. Right. 
And so the convection unit, I, I, in my opinion, I think this is this is probably the most difficult unit that we have here in uh, in heat transfer because there's there's just so much uh, going on, um, you know, in so many different formulas, so many different correlations, uh, so many different concepts. And so I, I put together a handout for you guys to help, um, you know, or uh, to basically help you organize all the information. Okay? And so that's posted on Canvas as well. So actually, let me go ahead and show you um, where that is. Okay, so here we are on the Canvas site, and you can see this is the uh, the page for week 12. And so I posted uh, two additional things for this week, right? And so the first thing you'll see is the uh, the summary handout. And so actually, let me go ahead and open that just so you can see what it looks like, okay? And so this is actually from, from two years ago. Um, you know, so I, I forgot to change the date. Okay? And here I, I basically, you know, summarized everything for you in, in convection. So it's it's, you know, it's, it's eight pages, but, you know, hope, I was, I'm hoping that, you know, this kind of puts all the formulas and all the concepts in one convenient place. Because I, I know it can be hard sometimes to, to look for things in the, uh, in the lecture notes. Okay? And I did this in my, and I did this in MS Word, so it's, it's a lot neater than my own handwriting as well, right? Um, and so definitely, you know, um, use this handout, um, you know, especially, you know, as, you know, if you want to use it to help you with the homeworks, that's, that's great too, okay? And you can see here, there's a bunch of heat exchanger stuff that we've yet to go over too. Um, you know, and this and this should you know help you guys out, and definitely use that as a resource for um, for the exam as well. Okay, because for the exam, you know, if you're doing like a internal convection problem and you're trying to remember, you know, what's what's the correlation for that, you can just look it up straight on this this handout. Okay, and it's nice and formatted and, and available for you guys. And then besides that, there's also the uh, um, the study guide, and so study guide looks the same as before. Uh, and so I've split it up into conceptual learning objectives and all as well as problem solving learning objectives. Okay. And so, you know, I would definitely go through this, this study guide as you're preparing to, to study for the exam. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and so remember the exam is next Wednesday um, and then we'll, we'll take it in class just like we did. Okay. All right. So any questions on the exam or any questions on the, on the homeworks that I can answer before we get started? Okay, all right, and so uh, so all that sh should be available for you guys now. Um, solutions for homework four are posted as well. I'm not sure if I if I uh, mentioned that, but you can find the solution for homework four, um, and then you know you'll have the solutions for homework five and homework six. You know once uh, you know to help you study for the exam as well. Okay, all right, and so let's go ahead and jump back. All right, and so let's jump back into the the lecture, and then let's uh, let's continue on with heat exchangers. All right, uh, and so just to refresh your memory, you know, heat exchangers are these uh, special um, engineering devices that are designed to um, transfer heat between two moving fluids. And so there, there's lots of different designs for, for heat exchangers out there. Um, you know, a lot of it depending on, you know, the, the kind of uh, engineering system that you're working with. But for this class, you know, we focus on a specific type of design called the concentric tube heat exchanger. And the idea with the concentric tube heat exchanger is that it's basically one smaller tube inside a bigger tube, right? And so inside the smaller tube, we have one um, fluid that's running through it. And then in the, um, um, you know, in the bigger cylinder, we have another fluid that's, that's flowing around, right? And so if we took kind of a, a, a slice, you know, kind of laterally um, across this concentric tube, you know, it would look like this, right? Where on the inside, let's say that we have, you know, fluid one, Um, you know, and fluid one could be anything from like oil, could be water, it could be air, it could be anything like that. Okay. And then in the bigger tube around it, we have another fluid that's running through it, and we'll call that fluid two. Okay. All 
right? And then let's say for now that fluid two is running from left to right as well. Okay. And so this is kind of like the side view, you know, um, sliced um, of that, right? Um, and so if you look at kind of the uh, straight down the, the tube, you know, it looks, it probably looks something like this. Right? And so in here you have fluid one, and then on the outside you have fluid two. Okay. And so fluid two is kind of in that space in between the inner cylinder and the outer one. And so just because I'm going to use this term uh, quite a bit today, you know, when we, when we, when I refer to kind of the, uh, the region where fluid two is running, I call this the, the annulus region. Right. And so an annulus is basically just a fancy, um, you know, scientific name for a donut, basically. Right. And so an annulus is basically a, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, an outer cylinder and an inner, inner cylinder and kind of the space in between those two. And so what we'll see later on is that the annulus has its own kind of uh, rules for how to determine things like the Reynolds number, the, um, how to determine things like the Neusel number um, that we'll use in, um, in our analysis. Okay. All right, and I think, you know, right before we, we left off last week, we were talking about specific flow configurations for these concentric tube heat exchangers. Um, and in particular, we just, uh, we just were starting to talk about parallel flow. And so parallel flow heat exchangers are basically heat exchangers that look like the one I have here, right? Where both the, both the fluids are flowing in the same direction, right? And so you can see here, both fluid one and fluid two are going from left to right, okay? And so that's, that's gonna be our parallel flow heat exchanger, right? So the opposite of this, of course, is counterflow. And so in counterflow, you know, both the fluids are going in opposite directions. Um, and then later on, you know, we'll talk about, uh, you know, the properties for, for that as well. Uh, okay, so any questions on uh, any of this so far? This is just kind of a recap from, from last week. Okay. All right, so one other important formula that, uh, that I want to actually uh, go over before uh, we talk about parallel flow heat exchangers is to compute the total amount of heat transfer um, inside, um, inside one of the fluids. And so this could apply either to, you know, either to the inner fluid or the outer fluid or the hot fluid, the cold flow, you know, this formula works for, for any of them, right? All right, so I'll define this as QXH, uh, where XH stands for heat exchanger. And so this is going to be equal to M dot CP times TM at the outlet, okay, of that, of that fluid minus TM of the inlet. For M dot right here, this is our mass flow rate. Okay. Typical units of this would be like kilograms per second. Okay. This CP right here, this is our specific heat. Okay. And I think the, uh, the units for this is typically joules per kilogram K, right? And so that's a property that you would look up from uh, um, from the property tables. Okay. TMO right here. This is the mean temperature at the outlet of that fluid. Okay. And TMI here. This is the mean temperature at the inlet. Keep in mind that you know this formula right here. This is for just one fluid, okay? And so things things are going to get a little bit confusing because you know with heat exchangers we have two different fluids, right? And so when you're taking the difference between the uh, the outlet temperature and the inlet uh, for this formula here, you want to make sure that it's for the same fluid, right? So you don't want to take you don't want to take the difference between the outlet temperature of one fluid and the inlet temperature of the other fluid because then that 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 wouldn't really make sense. Um, you know, so so make sure that you're you're keeping this you know keeping this the same, okay? and so uh, basically what you can you can you can write out this formula for both the hot fluid or the cold fluid, okay? It's just making sure that you know you're using the correct um, properties and you're using the correct temperatures for for each of them. Okay, 
All right, and so now that we've uh, we've got all that um, you know kind of intro information out, let's start talking about specific flow configurations. Okay, and so the first one, um, just like we mentioned before, is parallel flow heat exchangers. And so parallel flow heat exchangers, um, you know, their, their hallmark is that both of the fluids um, are moving in the same direction. Okay. And so you'll 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 see me um, use this uh, use the terms hot and cold fluid a lot. It doesn't mean that you know one has to be you know molten molten hot, and the other one has to be you know frigid cold. It's just you know whenever you have two different fluids, you know they're going to come in at different temperatures, and so one is always going to be hotter than the other one. Um, you know if if they came in at the same temperatures, then you know you wouldn't have any heat exchange. And so in order for them to exchange heat, one has to be just hotter than the other one. But, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, one has to be boiling hot or the other one has to be frozen cold or anything. Like that. It's just referring to, you know, which one is hotter than the other one. Okay. All right. And so parallel flow heat exchangers, you know, basically look like the same, um, you know, figure that I had on the previous one. Okay. All right. So if you have a hot fluid and a cold fluid, they would be moving at the same, in the same direction, okay? All right, so let me label a, a few things here that's, that'll help us, right? And so, okay, we'll say that the, uh, um, that the inlet temperature for the hot fluid, we'll call that THI, okay? And then the outlet temperature for the hot fluid, we'll call that THO, okay? And so for the cold fluid, we can have the same thing. And so we have TCI that refers to the inlet temperature of the cold fluid. Okay. And then the outlet temperature for the cold fluid, we'll call that TCO. Okay. And so I'm going to use these symbols to kind of refer to, um, you know, each of the two different, um, you know, heat transfers um, on the next page. Okay. Okay. Uh, so any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right. So to give you an idea of, you know, how these parallel flow heat exchangers work and how they, uh, you know, and how they perform, I'm going to draw a graph for you guys that shows, you know, how the temperatures in the fluid evolve as a function of X, right? And so if we call this direction here, the X direction, so going from left to right, okay. Let me draw a graph that looks like the following. And so on the x-axis of the graph, I'm going to have uh, um, x, which is just physical distance. And then the y-axis um, um, is going to be t for temperature. All right, so let's start with the hot fluid, right? And so hot fluid is going to come in. It's going to come in hot. And it's going to come in with the temperature THI, OK? Um, and then what's going to happen is that as this hot fluid you know, starts to exchange heat with the cold one, um, you know, it's, it's going to lose some of its heat because like some of that heat's going to go into the cold fluid. So what's going to happen is that this THI is going to drop down, okay? And so it's going to drop down like, like that, okay? Right. And so I drew the curve like this, you know, um, for a very specific reason, okay? And so what you'll see is that, you know, the, there's a, sharp a sharper decrease of temperature near the inlet of the heat exchanger. And then once it gets towards the outlet, it starts to level off. Okay. And the reason for that is, is because of how the, what the cold temp, what the cold fluid is doing. All right. And so on the left-hand side, you can see we have TCI, so the inlet temperature of the cold fluid. Okay. And then as this cold fluid um, receives heat from the hot fluid, then this cold fluid is going to start to heat up. Okay. And so it's going to look something like Um, and as you can imagine, you know, if you continue this graph, you know, all the way down, then eventually TCO and TCO are going to reach the, the same, okay? 
right. And so the, the reason I kind of draw, I drew the graph for you like this is to kind of highlight to you guys this distance right here. Okay. And so the distance in between, the vertical distance in between the hot fluid temperature and the cold fluid one, we call this delta T, or this is the, the, the difference in temperature. Okay. And so let's compare delta T, you know, on the inlet side where it's really long. And then delta T maybe somewhere over here, right here. Okay. Okay. And what you'll see is that, you know, because the hot fluid is getting cooler and the cold temperature, the cool fluid is getting warmer, then the difference in temperature between the two fluids as you go along the heat exchanger is going to shrink, right? And so this delta T or the difference in temperature is going to shrink, um, you know, as you as you go along the, the heat exchanger, okay? Okay. And this is really significant because, um, you know, um, delta T, remember, delta T represents the difference in temperature and that's needed to drive any heat transfer, you know, between the fluid. Okay. okay. And so if delta T here is going to be, is going to shrink, then that also means that the heat transfer will also shrink uh, or go down um, as you, you know, as you go further along in the heat exchanger. Um, and so generally what you'll see from parallel flow heat exchangers is that, you know, because at the inlets, you know, you have basically the hottest temperature possible um, at THI matched up with the coldest temperature possible TCI, then what you get is kind of a, a big burst of heat transfer near the inlet. But then after that big burst, then it kind of, you know, tailors off a little bit as you go down. Okay. And so what this basically means is that, you know, if, if you don't have a lot of space for your heat exchanger within your, within your system, right? Um, what we'll see is that parallel flow heat exchangers work really well for in these cases, because, you know, over a short distance, let's, let's say that, you know, we can only make our heat exchanger this long. Okay. I say that we only had this much space for a heat exchanger within, you know, our, our engine or aircraft or something like that then, you know, a parallel flow heat exchanger kind of gives us the most bang for our buck, you know, over that short distance, okay? Um, and so this is gonna be kind of opposite to counterflow heat exchangers where counterflow heat exchangers are kind of known for providing a more consistent um, heat transfer over a long distance of, um, or a long distance of space, okay? All right. And uh, one other thing to, to note about parallel flow heat exchangers is that, um, there's absolutely no way for these two graphs to cross each other. Okay, and so another way to say that it's it's impossible for the uh, for the temp for the cold fluid to ever exceed the temperature of the hot fluid anywhere. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, because the uh, the hottest point and the coldest point are kind of matched up, you know, and the graphs kind of get closer and closer to each other, it's impossible to, for those two graphs to kind of cross over each other because, you know, there always has to be a delta T in order for the to sustain some kind of heat transfer. Okay. Um, and so that that's kind of another design consideration for your parallel flow, where if you want to design a heat exchanger such that you get, you know, your cold temperature, um, you know, exceeds the hot one past a certain point, then you're going to need to use counterflow because that's that's only possible with with counterflow heat exchangers. Okay, but for parallel flow, 
you know, if you need a lot of heat transfer in a short amount of space, you know, parallel flow heat exchangers work really well for, for these cases. All right, so any, uh, any questions on, on that so far? Would, um, would it be best to have uh, multiple chambers, like have like the metal be, let's say the hot fluid and then two separate chambers carry cold fluid or would it be better to just have one, like the example you showed where you have one circular pipe of cold fluid and the hot fluid pipe in the middle? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Yeah, there's there's lots of different you know designs that, that are possible out there. Generally, what you want is uh, um, from your design is that uh, first of all, it has to fit somewhere. So that's that's usually your uh, your your biggest constraint. Um, and second of all, you know you want to maximize the amount of surface area where these two fluids are are in contact with each other. With each other. Um, and so the concentric tube works really well for this because you know you basically the one of fluid is basically enveloping the other fluid, um, and that kind of maximizes that surface area. Um, and not only that, you want to minimize the amount of material, uh, the amount of solid material in between the two fluids as well. Um, and so ideally, what you would want is just a very thin kind of piece of metal that separates the two fluids just so that, you know, the heat transfer can go across them very efficiently. And so if you add kind of too much uh, kind of complexity to the geometry, it kind of makes it difficult for the two fluids to really interact. And so those are kind of the two, um, you know, design criteria that you that you're usually running with with heat exchangers. But there's a lot of creativity in that space. Um, you know, for uh, for kind of interesting designs like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so that's uh, um, you know kind of the basics of paragol flow heat exchangers. Uh, but let's let's uh, let's kind of take a moment to talk about you know kind of going off that point about you know how do we you know quantify things like or how do we you know what factors go into a good design of a good um, you know heat exchanger. And so um, I know a couple pages ago, I, I wrote a formula for how to compute Q, right? Right. And so Q, remember, was m dot cp t o minus t i, right? And so this is this is fine um, if you have, uh, you know, if you know the inlet and outlet temperatures, okay. And so if you know the inlet and outlet temperatures for one of the fluids, uh, you can use this and, and it works great and it's simple. Um, but a lot of times you don't, you don't have that. Um, and a lot of times you're actually trying to find out what, what one of the outlet temperatures is or what one of the inlet temperatures is, right? And so um, it would be nice if we had kind of a different way to compute heat transfer that didn't involve, um, you know, that didn't involve, you know, knowing both the inlet and outlet temperatures for, for one of the fluids, okay? And so another way that we can formulate this heat transfer is to um, make it like a thermal resistance problem. Right? And so I know at this point, you know, I, probably you guys are, are really sick of thermal resistance type of problems, but you know, they're, they're a really nice way to kind of quantify these things, right? And so another way that we can compute heat transfer is to do something like delta T divided by R total, okay? Right, just kind of, kind of like as we always have. Except with heat exchangers, there's there's a few wrinkles that we have to get into um, in terms of computing the, the the temperature difference as well as computing the resistances. Right? And so let me let me start with the resistances first because I think that kind of builds directly off what we what we know. Okay. Okay. Um, and so the, um, the, the total resistance, um, you know, we can compute this kind of in the same way that we've known before. Uh, and in particular for heat exchangers, there's generally four different contributions to the total resistance. Okay. All right. Uh, and so the first contribution is, uh, is gonna be um, the convection resistances, um, convection resistance of the hot fluid. And uh, of course, you know that we're going to need the convection resistance of the cold fluid. Okay. 
Um, next, um, you know, those, those are probably the two biggest uh, contributors to the resistance. Um, and so next, um, we also need the conduction resistance of the separating wall. But, you know, most of the times if you design your heat exchanger well, you know, is usually not that much, especially if you're going to use some kind of metal. Okay. Um, and then fourth, um, sometimes you can, you can have this thing called um, um, fouling, uh, which, which affects, um, you know, the contact resistance. Okay. Uh, and so fouling is, is basically, um, you know, it's, it's, it's called that in the textbook, but you can almost think of it as almost like kind of rust or kind of any kind of gunk or any kind of, uh, you know, dirt that gets on that, on that surface in between the, uh, the two fluids, right? And so this, this happens a lot with heat exchangers because, you know, you have basically fluid that's con moving constantly towards it. And so just naturally, you know, stuff is going to kind of build up on that solid surface in between the two. Um, and so usually we call this fouling. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of think of it as just kind of the, um, just kind of gunk or rust that kind of builds up on kind of the heat exchanger walls um, after a lot of use. Okay. So one example of this is, uh, you know, over the weekend, I, my, my cat drinks out of this kind of little fountain that, that kind of, um, you know, it, 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 you know, drips the water down in like a waterfall that encourage her to drink. Um, and I hadn't cleaned it in a, in, in, a, in a few weeks. And so I cleaned it and there was all this kind of like weird kind of like gunk on it, which is weird, you know, because we, we put, you know, purified water in there and, you know, it's, uh, you know, um, you know, the pump is, is not that big, but just, you know, just, just over time, just like, you know, dirt gets into it, you know, um, of course the cat's saliva is in there too. And so, you know, there's, uh, there's always going to be some stuff, um, stuff that kind of builds up in these kinds of systems whenever you have fluid that's kind of constantly flowing. Okay. Uh, all right. So any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. And so now I want to spend a bit of time to talk about, you know, how do we compute the convection resistance um, of the outer tube? Okay. Um, because this is kind of a unique shape that we haven't seen yet. Okay. And so remember from the, from the beginning of class today, I've defined that term called an annulus, right? And so an annulus is basically kind of the donut shape where the outer fluid flows in, right? Um, and so in order to find the convection resistance of this, uh, of this annulus, we need to know, um, you know the convection coefficient, right? And to find the convection coefficient, we need to find the neutral numbers, okay? Um, but we don't have a neutral number correlation for an annulus. And so we're going to need another set of, uh, of data in order to, to compute this, OK? Um, and so um, you know, the, uh, in the book, um, when, when I wrote these lecture notes, it used to be tables 8.2 and 8.3. So I, it should be the same. But let me give you the values for, um, uh, for this um, as well, OK? All right, so if we, if we have our annulus that looks like this, OK? And remember, we're, we're solving for the neutral number for the flow on the outside. Okay. Okay. Now I want a donut. Okay. And let me define two different lengths here. Right? And so for the, the first length that I'll um, define here is the DO, DO being the outer diameter. Okay. And then DI is going to be the inner diameter for this, for this annulus. And so knowing that information, you can go up to table 8.2 in the book. And then what you'll see is a table that looks like this. Okay. Right. And so in the first column, you have a, a, a column called DI over DO. And what this is basically is, is the ratio of the inner diameter and the outer diameter. Okay. 
And let me give you some of the values here. And so it starts from zero, then it goes from zero to 0 0.05 to 0 0.1, 0 0.25, um, 0 0.5, okay. Then after that, you'll have two different columns, right? And so if one column, this column here will be called NUI, okay? And the third column will be NUO, okay? And I'll explain kind of the difference in between the two columns in a bit, but let me go ahead and fill in the values for, for this. Uh, and then NUO, you know, there's stuff here, but but we don't really care, right? Okay. And so for uh, specifically for heat exchanger problems, you know, when we're looking for the convection coefficient for the outer the outer annulus, what you want right here is this is this column right here, right? Because what this column is is these are the neutral numbers when the outer diameter is insulated. Okay, and so that's that's usually the case that we're running with uh, for heat transfer um, or heat exchangers, right? Because the um, if you kind of remember from last week, kind of the main assumption that we made was that the only heat transfer that occurs in the system is going to be between the two fluids, right? And so we don't have any heat loss that comes off the outside of the of the annulus. Okay, and so what we're basically assuming is that you know that outer surface there is 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 insulated. This third column here are the neutral numbers for if the inner diameter is insulated, um, but we're not we're not dealing with those situations. So we're only concerned with you know when the outer um, cylinder is uh, um, or the outer diameter is it's insulated. Okay. All right. And so in order to use this table, um, you basically just have to find the ratio between the inner diameters and the outer diameters, and then look up NUI from this table. And so this, this table right here is also given to you in the, uh, um, in the convection summary handout. And so I think it's kind of near the, the end, okay? Uh, and so you can use that table you know, for, your, uh, for, your, for your homeworks and also for the, for the exam, okay? All right, and so, but now, uh, but now that we have an expression for the neutral number or a way to compute it, um, you know, we can use this information to find the neutral number. And then from there, we can use that to find the, uh, um, you know, the convection coefficient and then from the convection coefficient, we can find the convection resistance of the annulus, okay? Okay, um, so any questions on, on this? Okay, all right, and so uh, that's for the annulus. And so, you know, when you're, uh, when you're working with kind of the outer fluid in a heat exchanger, you know, make sure you, uh, you use the, uh, um, you know, you use this neutral number. So you don't use a different, you don't use the incorrect neutral number correlation. Okay. All right, and so the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, called the log mean temperature difference. And so if you, if you remember from our uh, heat transfer um, you know, equation, okay. and so the heat transfer in a heat exchanger is the difference in temperature um, divided by R total. Okay. Um, but we have a problem here, right? Because whenever we, we've used this um, equation in the past, we've basically assumed that delta T here is, is constant. But we've we've seen already from the uh, um, you know from the parallel flow heat exchanger that this delta T is constantly changing within a parallel flow heat exchanger, okay? even with a counterflow one that you'll see there. There's still going to be some variations between these. Okay? Okay. 
And so if this, if this temperature difference is always changing, um, you know, then how, how can we, you know, how can we, um, you know, use that in a formula here? So which one do we use? Okay. And so that's where this log mean temperature difference comes into play, because the log mean temperature difference basically allows us to compute just one temperature difference for the entire heat exchanger that kind of encapsulates everything. Okay. All right. And so things are about to get a, a little bit hairy here because of because of all the uh, of, of all the indices. And so, um, you know, you might have to look back on this, you know, a couple times just to kind of um, get it. Even even I still get a little bit confused. Okay. But let me go ahead and draw this this figure for you, um, just to kind of uh, um, kind of help guide our guide our discussion. Okay. And so let's say that we have our concentric, uh, you know, two p exchanger. And there's our two fluids. And so, you know, just like we usually do, we have fluid A on the interior and fluid B on the exterior. Okay. Okay. And so uh, for the all the temperatures on the left, we're going to label them with a subscript of one, right? And so the temperature of B on the left is called TB1. And then the temperature of, of fluid A on the left is TA1. And you'll notice on the bottom there, I have TB1 because it's concentric two, right? And so that tells us that the left side of this, uh, of this diagram here, we'll call this side one, okay? And then the right side of this diagram, we'll call it side two. Right? And so that makes all of the, the temperature on the right um, TB2, okay? And so this, you know, for, for now, you know, we're not making any assumptions on whether this is parallel flow or counter flow. This is just kind of general, okay? And so instead of saying, you know, one size is the inlet, one size is the outlet, that's why I'm using kind of one and two here, because this these relationships will, will, will work, you know, for, um, you know, for anything, okay? Okay, and so now that we've defined, um, you know, side one and side two, we can start to define some of the temperature differences. Okay. All right, so first let's define a, a variable called delta T1. Okay. And so delta T1 will be the different, will be the difference in temperature between the fluids on side one of the, um, of the diagram. And so delta T1 will be um, basically um, TA1 minus TB1. Right, so basically every the, the temperature difference just on one side of the heat exchanger. Okay, delta T2 is just gonna be the temperature difference on the other side. Okay? So this is gonna be TA2 minus TB2. So let me mark these in green. Okay. Right. And so with those two temperature differences defined, we can define now the log mean temperature difference. Okay. And so I'll define that as delta T LM. Okay. And so delta T LM will be delta T2 minus delta T1 divided by ln of delta T2 divided by delta T1, okay? And so this right here is our log mean temperature difference. Should be delta T one right here. Okay, and so you can almost think of this temperature difference as kind of like um, almost like um, like a, like a, an average or a lump sum um, temperature difference between the two fluids. Okay, um, and so when you're computing the heat transfer using the thermal resistance equation, you have to use this delta T ln up here. Okay, 
Okay, so this delta T L M gets plugged up here. Right? Okay, and so if you find delta T L M um, and then you find the total resistance, you just take the the difference in between them, or you take their uh, you divide them, and then that will give you the uh, the the total amount of heat transfer in your um, in your heat exchanger. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, any questions on on this so far? And if we had, let's say, four fluids in total, we would just have another delta T three then. Ah, so if you have a if you have uh, additional fluids in here, and so like you say, if you have like another fluid that kind of wraps around around this. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so that that gets a little bit complicated because then um, now you have basically you know a fluid because um, right now you know we're, we we've made these. Um, you know, um, expressions under the assumption that, you know, the only amount of heat transfer is going between heat fluid A and fluid B. And so if you add another fluid into the equation, you know, that complicates things because then now you can have fluid B um, is going to be transferring fluid up here too. And so that, that makes it a little bit more difficult to, to find equations for that. And I, I'm actually not, I'm actually not familiar myself with, with the, what the theory is like um, if you do have something like that, because then because uh, then a lot of our assumptions kind of go out the window if you have another uh, fluid like that. And so um, I think that one, that one you'd probably have to um, probably use a different set of equations for. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions on this before we jump into counterflow heat exchangers? Okay. All right, so let's talk uh, counterflow heat exchangers now. Okay. And so counterflow heat exchangers are kind of the opposite of parallel flow, where, uh, where remember in parallel flow, both the fluids are going in the same direction. Now for counterflow, we're gonna flip one of them and have it go the other direction. Okay. And so we'll call this fluid B, fluid B. Okay. And so let's say that fluid B runs from uh, left to right. Okay. And then fluid A will let it go from right to left. Um, and so this, this actually changed things uh, quite a bit because remember um, for the parallel flow heat exchanger, um, the hottest point, the hottest um, fluid and the, cold, the, the hottest point of the hot fluid and the coldest point of the cold fluid, those two were matched up. Um, and so here it's, it's kind of the opposite. And so let me go ahead and write out the uh, um, the temperatures here. Okay. And we'll say if uh, we'll say fluid B, so we'll call this the hot fluid, right? And so we'll call this uh, THI is over here. Okay. And then we have THO over here, right? I remember THI is always going to be greater than THO because you know the fluid, the hot fluid cools down. And then for the cold fluid, you know, the inlet is on the right and then the outlet is on the, the left, okay? All right, so previously we, uh, for the parallel flow, we had TCI and THI, you know, those were at the exact same kind of physical locations, right? And so you had the hottest, the hottest point and the coldest point kind of matched up. And then that gives you kind of a big burst of, of heat transfer in the beginning, right? Here now they're, they're separated because we put them, you know, on the other sides. And so what this says is, uh, so, and so what this tells us is that, you know, we're not going to have a huge spike in delta T like we did in the uh, in the parallel flow, okay? 
And so delta T never gets too high. Uh, and since delta T never gets too high, then the amount of heat transfer that occurs, you know, um, doesn't uh, doesn't reach kind of extreme values. Okay. Okay. But what the counterflow heat exchanger is really good at is that it, it provides a really good consistent heat transfer um, you know, throughout its entire length. Okay. Okay, and so this is going to affect the the temperature profiles that we'll see on the on the next page. Okay, uh, okay. so any uh, any questions on, on this so far? <clears throat> okay, All right, so let's go ahead and write the same graph that we did before. And so on the bottom axis, we have X, and on the Y axis, we have T, okay? Let me go ahead and draw, um, you know, the hot temperature first, okay? Okay, and so we're gonna assume that the hot, the hot fluid starts from the, uh, from the left, okay? okay? And what you'll see is that there's gonna be a, a more consistent, uh, you know, amount of heat transfer. And so instead of being an, an exponential curve down, what we have here instead is a, a curve that looks a lot more linear, okay? Okay, and then the cold fluid is, is kind of, uh, kind of go right in between or, you know, um, right below it, okay? And so this difference right here, which is delta T, is this is more consistent down the length, okay? Right. And so instead of having you know one big burst of delta T right at the inlet, this delta T is kind of distributed more all throughout, nicely through the pair, through the counterflow heat exchanger. Okay. Right. One other thing that you should notice here is that TIO. Um, the, the outlet temperature of the cold fluid, you know, I drew this on purpose so that it's actually higher than THO, okay? And this is something that's unique to counterflow heat exchangers, okay? okay. Uh, and so in counterflow, you know, the outlet temperature of the cold fluid can actually ex exceed the outlet temperature of the hot fluid. Um, and, it's, and it's primarily because, you know, we don't have the hottest point and the coldest point matching up um, right next to each other at the beginning, right? And so because they're separated, this kind of allows for a more consistent amount of heat transfer all throughout the length. And you can have the situation where you actually heat the cold fluid, you know, above, you know, the, the outlet temperature for the hot one, and the hot one goes, you know, goes down further than that, okay? Right. And so this, this is impossible with parallel flow. And so you can only get this in counter flow, okay? Uh, professor? Yeah. Would this be what they use in the um, uh, rocket when they pass the uh, liquid nitrogen or whatever the fluid over the um, the heat thing? Uh, or is that something different? No, no. I, I think uh, you know. I think it's a fair question. Um, I, I, I wish I wish I was privy to those details, so so I, I could tell you. Um, I'm sure you know. It's it's some kind of heat exchanger that they that they use. I'm not sure if they use a, a parallel flow or a counter flow. Um, that would that would be you know determined by the design um, 
specs for, for the rocket. Um, but some kind of heat exchanger must be there because, you know, that, that liquid nitrogen basically has to absorb, you know, a lot of the heat from, you know, the engine and from, you know, from, uh, from you know, um, leaving the, uh, the atmosphere and all that stuff too. And so it's some kind of heat exchanger, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the design is. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so now that we have both, now that we know uh, both um, the paragolf flow and the counter flow, you know, the question is, you know, which one is better? Um, and so generally what you want from a heat exchanger is that you want the heat exchanger to exchange as much heat as possible, you know, within, within the constraint, within the design constraints, right? And so uh, the, the best heat exchanger is going to be the one that, you know, provides this kind of the most, the most heat transfer for, uh, for the design, okay? And the way that you determine that basically depends on the length of the heat exchanger. And so for heat exchangers that, uh, or for situations where you don't have a lot of space in order to, um, to exchange heat, um, then parallel flow is better. Because remember in parallel flow, you know, over that short distance, you have just a huge burst of, uh, of heat transfer because you, know, you have the hottest point and the coldest point basically right next to each other. Um, but remember, you know, for parallel flow heat exchangers, the performance of that um, really goes down dramatically over, you know, over some distance, right? And so if you want a heat exchanger that, that performs, you know, that does you know, a greater overall amount of heat transfer and space isn't really an issue for you, um, then longer lengths will, will work better for this. Um, just because, you know, um, if you have a longer amount of space, then, you know, you can basically maintain this consistent delta T over a longer period of time. Um, and the longer you, per, you, um, you continue that, you know, the more heat transfer that you're going to, that's going to occur. Okay. Because the problem that you run into for parallel flow is that, you know, eventually, you know, if you run two fl fluids parallel to each other, they're, they're going to reach the same temperature. And once they reach the same temperature, um, basically no more heat transfer can occur. And then once, if no more heat transferring is occurring, then you're basically just wasting a bunch of space because you're running the fluid through a bunch of pipes, which is not transferring any heat at all. Right? And so you have, if you have a lot of space and you want kind of an o a greater overall amount of heat transfer, counter flow is kind of the, uh, you know, um, the one for you. All right. And so that's a lot of theory that we went over. And so uh, last thing I want to do today is I wanted to do an example, right? So we might not get through the whole thing, but I, I at least wanted to start um, quite a bit of it. But before we do that, are there uh, are there any questions on any of this? Okay. All right. So let's do an example just to show you kind of um, how all of these uh, um, all of these all this information kind of goes um, together. Okay. Okay. And so let's say that we have a counterflow um, concentric a counterflow concentric tube heat exchanger. Okay. All right, and so it's going to look just like this. Right. And on the outside, um, you know, in the outer tube or in the annulus, let's say that we have oil. Okay. And on the inside, let's say that we have water. Okay. And so it doesn't really matter because the uh, um, the fluids are going in opposite directions, but let's say that the water is going from right to left. Okay. And then let's say the oil is going from left to right. Okay. Right. 
And so for this, uh, uh, for this pipe, we're gonna have, we're gonna need two diameters. And so we need the inner diameter, we'll call that DI. Okay. And so we'll say that DI in this case is equal to 25 millimeters. Okay. And then the outer diameter, we'll say it's equal to 45 millimeters. Okay. And then for this case, we also know the inlet temperatures of the two of the two fluids. Okay. Right. And so for the oil, let's say that we're going to start at a temperature of 100 degrees C, right? So pretty hot oil. And the water is just water running from the tap. And so let's say that the water is at a you know 30 degrees C. Okay. Okay. Um, and so let's. Uh, um, Let's go ahead and start this uh, this problem, okay? Because in this problem, what we want to do is we want to find the length of the heat exchanger to cool the oil down to 60 degrees C. And so what this tells us is that by the outlet of the um, um, of the um, by the outlet of the uh, of the oil, we should reach a temperature of sixty degrees. And so this tells us that T oil outlet this has to equal sixty degrees. Okay. All right. And so we don't know the outlet temperature of the water yet, um, but we can go ahead and find that later on. Okay. All right. And so uh, in addition to this just to kind of make our lives a little bit easier. Let's assume that the wall separating the, uh, the water and the oil um, has negligible contact um, conduction resistance. Um, and then we're also going to assume that there's no fouling. Okay. And so the only thermal resistances that we're going to worry about are just the thermal resistances, the convection resistances of the oil and the, and the water. Okay. Uh, okay. And so the first thing that we're going to do in this problem is uh, we're going to run through our convection problem solving methodology to solve for the convection coefficients of the oil and the water. Okay. Use those to compute the, uh, um, you know, um, the um, resistances, okay, and then use that information to solve for for the micro. Okay. All right. And so, uh, any any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, um, and start working on this problem. Okay. And so first thing we're going to do, and so it's, it's, it's a fairly long problem. And so, you know, we're going to tackle this in kind of a multiple sets. And so first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute the convection resistances of the water and the oil. So that's going to be our first step, um, you know, and, and we know how to do this because, you know, this is something that we've done, you know, for like four weeks now. Okay. And so basically we're going to apply our con convection problem solving methodology. Okay? And we're going to do it twice, you know, one for the oil and one for the water. Okay. All right. So first thing, um, you know, is always, you know, which is uh, kind of the step that's most often uh, skipped is we, we need to identify the situations. Because that's going to tell us, you know, which Neusel number correlations to use 
uh, which Reynolds number equations to use and, and all that stuff. Okay. All right. And so let's start with the, uh, uh, with the water on the inside, okay? And so uh, um, I'm using A here to denote the water. Okay. So for the water, what we have is internal flow in a cylindrical tube. And then for the oil, what we have is a um, flow of um, oil in an annulus. Which is also internal flow. Okay. All right. And so uh, we have identified those situations now. And so the next thing is we need to evaluate the fluid properties. And so let's start with the with the water, okay? And so uh, we have to make an assumption here, and so we have to make an assumption for the film temperature. Okay. Uh, and so for the film temperature, we know that the water is going to heat up to a certain degree. We don't know how much the water is going to heat up, but we know it's going to heat up. And so uh, just to be conservative, let's evaluate the properties at 35 degrees C, okay? Because we know that the inlet temperature of the water is gonna be 30 degrees C, and it's gonna heat up to, to some degree. And so let's pick a, a number that's higher than 30. Uh, and so that's why we picked 35 for here, okay? And I think it's also convenient just because it's, it's easy to pick that off from the table, okay? All right, and so if we read off the properties from this at this temperature, either from an online calculator or from the book, what we get is CP is equal to 4178 uh, joules per kilogram K. Okay, then we get the um, dynamic viscosity is equal to 725 times 10 to the minus 6 uh, Newton second meter squared. And then K, um, this is 0 0.625 uh, watts per meter K. Okay. And so that's everything that we need for the, uh, for the water. And now let's do for the oil. Okay. For the oil, we do know the inlet and outlet temperatures. And so, um, you know, we, the, we know the inlet temperature is 100. Uh, and the outlet temperature is 60. And so let's go ahead and split the difference. And let's pick a film temperature of 80 degrees C. Okay. Then let's evaluate all the properties. So we know that CP is 2131 uh, joules per kilogram K. Okay. Um, viscosity is uh, 3.25 times 10 to the minus two. And so oil is significantly more viscous than water, which you know makes sense. Okay. okay. And then K is going to be 0 0.135, uh, 138, sorry, 0 0.138 watts per meter K. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, and so that's the, uh, um, that's the, that's, those are the properties that we need, okay? All right, so uh, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, and so now that we have the properties, uh, we're ready to compute the, uh, the Reynolds numbers. And then to compute these, we need the uh, the mass flow rate, which I uh, I forgot to give you on the first page. Okay, so let me go ahead and give it to you here. 
And so let's assume that the mass flow rate of water is going to be 0 0.2 kilograms per second. Okay. And the mass flow rate of the oil is going to be 0 0.1 kilograms per second. Okay. All right. And so in order to compute the, the, um, the Reynolds numbers, we need to compute the mean velocities. Okay. And so the way that we do that is we need, we do UM is equal to M dot divided by rho times area. Okay, where rho is the density of the fluid and then A is the cross-sectional area, okay? And so for the water, this is, uh, this is easy. Okay, for the, so for the water, uh, since it's flowing inside an inner tube, um, the area is just gonna be pi over four di squared, okay? But for the oil, it's a little bit more complicated because remember the oil is flowing in an annulus, right? And so the cross-sectional area is just going to be the area of the of that annulus. Okay. And so area is going to be pi over four times DO squared minus DI squared. Okay. Where this right here is the cross-sectional area of the annulus. And so now that we uh, we have that, um, you know, we go ahead and compute the uh, the mean the mean velocities here. So we can just go ahead and plug those in. From here, we can compute the Reynolds number. Okay. But remember, the Reynolds number is um, rho times u m times diameter divided by the viscosity. Okay. And so because you know the viscosities in the previous part were given to us in dynamic form, I'm putting the Reynolds number in dynamic form as well. Okay. Because so this is the exact same as if we did um times d divided by nu, okay. Um, it's just that nu, the kinematic viscosity, is just dynamic viscosity divided by density, okay. And so that's why I just kind of replace it there, okay. All right. But we have to make one more adjustment here um, because uh, you know the annulus doesn't have a um, prescribed diameter. Okay. Okay. And so we're going to use something called the hydraulic diameter. Okay. And so the hydraulic diameter is just the difference in diameters between the outer and inner cylinder. Okay, so dh is going to be do minus di. Okay. okay, and then for the and then for and so for the annulus, we can go ahead and plug in this dh in for d right here. Okay. Okay. Um, and so we can go ahead and plug this all in to find the Reynolds number for the annulus and the Reynolds number for the um, for the water as well. Okay. All right, so uh, any questions on um, on this so far? Okay. And so with all that in mind, let's go ahead and compute the uh, um, um, the Reynolds numbers. Okay, so let's start with the water. And so for the water, the Reynolds number is going to be um, rho u m di divided by mu. Okay. Let's go ahead and plug in for u m. Okay, so remember u m is um, four m dot water divided by rho pi di squared. Okay. So this right here is um, okay. and so we plug all that in, and we get a Reynolds number of fourteen thousand 
zero five zero. Okay, uh, which is you know very turbulent. Right, so that's for the inner cylinder for the water, and then now we can do the same thing for the oil. Okay, and so for the oil, remember we're using the hydraulic diameter instead of the the usual one. Okay, and so if we go ahead and plug in for um and dh, okay. we first we have rho over mu, and this is going to be times four m dot oil divided by um, rho pi do squared minus di squared. Okay. And so that's um. Okay, and then dh is going to be do minus di. Okay. Right. And so we plug in for all of those values for the annulus and we end up with a Reynolds number of 56.0. which is laminar, okay? All right, uh, and so this is good. So now that we know the Reynolds numbers, uh, we can go ahead and continue on with the next step of finding their neutral numbers, okay? But we'll continue that on Wednesday because uh, we're all out of time today. So um, are there any final questions I can answer before we sign up for today? All right, so, uh, so thank you guys for tuning in today. Uh, we'll pick this up on Wednesday and we'll finish up this example and then we'll finish up the rest of the, uh, of the heat exchanger notes as well, right? And so have a great day, everyone, and I'll see everyone on, on Wednesday. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, guys. Professor, I had a really quick question about sure. the exam. Sure, what's up? For the, um... The new slit number, I know we have like, there's a bunch of different like formulas. Are you going to possibly give us like a hint to which one to use or we just gonna have to like write it down basically? So, so part of the convection problems that is that you have to determine, you know, which new slit number correlation, which, which equation to use for a given situation. Right. Uh, and so I, I've given you the handout with, with all the ones I expect you to know, mm -hmm. uh, but choose, but choosing the right one for the situation is that's, that's going to be up to you. And that's, that's part of, that's part of what I'm assessing you on for the exam. Okay. And, that, and that's the, the handout you just gave us the, um, Correct. the, what is that called? The convection summary handout? That one? Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm not going to ask you anything beyond that. And so it's, you know, every, basically all the information, all the formulas that you need for the exam are, is going to be on that handout, but, uh, but you need to, but you need to choose which one to use for a given situation. Got it. Okay. Cause I have a list of like, every single one and i'm like damn it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot it's a lot that, that's why i made the handout because it's 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 a lot to uh to keep track of gotcha okay all right well thank you have a good yep. one yep you too oh professor yep. one last thing uh quickly um i found two uh i'll send you i'll send the uh send them over through the email but i found like uh two uh reports one of them is on the um a review on uh, cooling, uh, sorry, review on the cooling, uh, film cooling of liquid rocket engines. Okay. And the other one is, uh, well, I don't know if it's something that you might be interested in. It's the atomization and dense fluid breakup. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, I'd, I'd love I'd love to, to take a look. Yeah, if you can okay. send them to me, that'd be, that'd be good. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, since it's just us right now, you know, for, for summer projects, um, you know, I'm always happy to, you know, to mentor those uh, to stu for students on that. Um, and, and typically, you know, I, 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 there's kind of two, I mean, for, um, for you, I think there, there's kind of two options that you have kind of available. And so you can do a project that's, um, that's kind of researchy, that's, that's kind of more in line with kind of my own uh, kind of research, research goals. Um, and so, uh, you know, the kinds of research that I typically do is I'm, I'm interested in, in biomedical applications of engineering technology, basically. So uh, in particular, what I do is I, I do, um, you know, computational simulations of blood flow. And so typically, um, you know, um, have you heard the term CFD before, computational fluid dynamics? Um, I think I've heard it here and there, but not, no, I would say not in depth. Okay. 
Yeah, so, so basically it's just a technology used to, to simulate um, fluid flow. And so traditionally it's, it's used a lot in aerospace to, to, you know, to find you know, airflow patterns around like airplanes and rocket ships and things like that. Uh, but I, I use that same technology to, to simulate blood flow basically. Uh, and then from that, you know, we can, you know, you can do all sorts of different kinds of research. And so um, that's, that's one option. Um, but, you know, if there, if there's something personal that, that you're interested in, like, you know, maybe like a heat transfer problem or, um, or something like that, then I'd be happy to advise for, for that as well. Okay. Um, but I, I wouldn't be able to give as, as good a feedback, you know, if it wasn't about, um, you know, my research stuff. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was just, um, curious because that's one um uh, i'm in the i'm trying to join the uh, formula sae 